I look for those experiences of being a foreigner or being a, a kind of outside of the thing. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Norwegian Newcomers, the podcast where we hear fragments from the lives of Norway's immigrant population. My name is Vedran Atanovic, and today's story is about art. Doing art, I think it's really useful to have a look from outside. It's about getting out of the comfort zone to get new impulses and living true to your own philosophy. I think this gives a different perspective and a different insight. This is Nelly's story. Nelly, welcome to our uh, little podcast family in the region newcomers. Hello and thank you for having me. For the very beginning, I would like you to present yourself, to tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Nelly Winterhalder, as Norwegians would say. Uh, I'm a German and I moved to Norway in 2006. So I've been here for 15 like years <laughs> and I'm working as a um, playwright and theater director in Norway. I'm a trained actress and I studied literature, Italian literature. I grew up in the southwest of Germany, close to Freiburg in the countryside, a very small town. Went to school there and lived there. My parents are born in this little town and they never left. So I had to go far away. <laughs> First, I went to study in Munich and then I did a year abroad in Genoa. And I met this Norwegian guy. And after some time in Munich, I decided to go to Norway. The surroundings where I come from, the Black Forest, um, this is quite similar to um, the Oslo surroundings minus the ocean. And um, there are really nice old towns like Freiburg. Going towards uh, Munich, there's Augsburg and Ulm and all these smaller towns, but um, beautiful old towns. There's a lot of culture and architecture to, to see. And the sausages, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sausages and the best beer and yeah, Oktoberfest. But you studied in Munich, yeah? Yeah, I was doing uh, literature studies at university. In the afternoons, I was doing a marketing job, working in office job. And uh, in the evenings and in the weekends, I would go to theatre school to get my education as an actress. Uh, some of my dearest friends went to theatre school with me. So, there, But there, I'm the only one living abroad. I mean, being an actress, it's not, it's not a great idea. Doing art, I think it's really useful for my work, at least, to have a look from outside. So I really, I look for those experiences of being a foreigner or being a, a kind of outside of the thing, <laughs> whatever it is. I think this it give, gives an, a different perspective and a different insight I mean, doing art, you you have you have to be comfortable with the non-linear structures, breaking up all the time, making new experience and new, new friends, and this is kind of part of your work life as an artist. So you have to kind of like it and look for it. I've been, I mean, I've been working like that forever, but uh, two years ago I just formalized it in this uh, theater collective. And it's called Ensemble. Ensemble. The process is really important. So we made this uh, the center of our work philosophy. We are doing live art, mostly theater, but um, more to come. So I had uh, one year to finish um, at university for my um, master's. And I convinced this uh, Norwegian uh, guy to move to Munich with me. And he had to write his master thesis, so he just uh, did this in Munich. And I, I really didn't care about him being Norwegian. In Italy, I was meeting so many people and many, many students from many countries, so you don't care if someone is French or doesn't matter. This Norwegian uh, guy, he finished his uh, studies and he got a job in Norway and I was really pissed. 
he got the job and uh, it was not my plan to move to Norway and it was surely not my plan as a feminist to move across Europe to a country that I never been there never I don't know what Norwegian is I don't know I mean and then I decided no I have to if I ever do this I have to decide for it myself I can't just make him responsible for that He was getting a job at Sandefjord in the south of Norway, uh, in a little town, and I was convinced that I have to do this on my own. So I moved to Norway as well, <laughs> but not to Sandefjord. <laughs> I didn't want to be the girlfriend of, so I decided to move to Oslo because this is the th city where it's happening, I thought, <laughs> without having been there. I spent uh, all the weekends at Sandefjord, of course, And I slowly managed to get my own life in Oslo. But can you recall, what were the first, those first impressions of Oslo? First time ever I was in Norway, I came from the airport and went uh, to the Julebord. And uh, th this was quite shocking. Why? Tell us. I, I, I know why, <laughs> mostly, but... People were getting so drunk. And I mean, I lived in Munich, but... People were getting so wasted <laughs> at this unit. <laughs> I know. I'm used to I'm used to this to having a lunch and a glass of wine. I think this is completely normal, and this is it's not possible in Norway. I, I was shocked about the masses and yeah, how wasted people got in yeah in like one hour and a half. Uh, it was. <laughs> the party was over for some of them. Yeah, that was shocking uh, <laughs> to me also. It kind of, oh, come on, we have the whole night, we shouldn't be after two hours dead. <laughs> But then some of my dearest Norwegian friends, they were saying, oh, yeah, what's the difference? You are alcoholic 24-7 and we are just on the weekends for two <laughs> hours. <laughs> what, uh, uh, what did you have a feeling at the very beginning? You have the wish? Did you have any, any thoughts that, oh, I, I'll... I'll I will stay here while I'm temporary here. I, I, I had for myself, I had to keep it to one year to make it less scary, maybe. Um, because I just, uh, I finished uh, studies of Italian literature and uh, as an actress. So it was really not useful for my job in any in any way to, to move to Norway. So I thought, okay, maybe I just declare this as one year to learn the language and, and to get to know another country and another culture and to see what's what's happening with this guy. And yeah, let's just take it easy. And then I just started taking a language course. And this is, was going really fast. As I said, speaking German and English, it's not that difficult is quite close also I, i love to learn languages and if i could get paid for that <laughs> <laughs> i would just learn languages <laughs> my whole life that's great that, because you are speaking also italian yeah yes yeah so italian norwegian of course germany and yeah french we should start with some with some uh, serbo croatian bosnian <laughs> language yeah That would be fun. I actually, I almost never ever speak English, so it's a bit strange. So you learn the language, you find a job. Did you have a clue in that after one year that the story or Norwegian story just continuing? Or you had the wish to go back home or anywhere else? No, I after one year I decided that um, now I I did all the hard work and now I'm getting somewhere with finally speaking Norwegian and understanding Norwegian and being able to write some Norwegian and so it would be stupid to just throw it away. And then the Norwegian guy he moved to Oslo. <laughs> so that was a good thing. I convinced him. <laughs> that was the first time living together and um Yeah, we're still living together, so it went quite well. And it's it's really easy to tell many years after, but um, yeah. And I'm uh, as a person, I'm not ever focusing on the bad details <laughs> and memories. I'm living on the bright side. But uh, I know it's, it's not that easy as it may sound afterwards. I felt I have to accept that I'm just, I have to just start on the bottom. And you're doing all these... Um, 
best case student jobs. And uh, I mean, this is kind of easy when you're mid 20s, but it's getting harder and uh, coming from a good job, maybe in your home country or from abroad. This is quite hard to accept. So it's going small steps and crawling upstairs. <laughs> I was spending a whole lot of time alone. Being severe with myself and moving to Oslo alone. And I found, found it hard to get to know people. And I found it a bit boring <laughs> just to get to know uh, foreign, other foreigners. I wanted to enter Norwegian society and get Norwegian friends. And that was really, really hard. Of course, it's a two-way thing, but... Um, I think it's, it's a culture that it takes quite some time before you get invited in some Norwegian house. And when you're making it to a hitter, then you're quite part of the family. But it might take you 10 years or not ever happen. It's, uh, it's not easy. I think it's about being polite and a different attitude towards uh, what is being polite. Norwegian politeness is giving space and not coming too close too soon. I was interpreting that uh, as a, oh, I'm, I'm not worth of being invited or I'm not worth of you getting close to me. No, it's not personal at all. It's about giving space and freedom. I, I would say, I can't say different. And really n now also from six years later, I even... From this place, you go, oh, this, that was super crazy what I did. Or how, when we finally make the decision, I said, okay, we are just going there and starting from zero to hero. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's really interesting because I did this experiment with my family in 2018. We went to Germany to live there for one year. I was getting a bit, um, maybe just bored. I needed some new impulses and we, we had been talking about spending some time abroad and actually it was my husband bringing it up and maybe we should go to Germany. Not making any new experiences and get this new thing, but getting closer to what is part of our heritage and um, for the children to get... Uh, they, they were barely speaking German, they were understanding German. But um, yeah, I was always being sad about that. And he suggested that maybe we just use one year to see what is there and how this would be for our family. For him as well, he finally learned some German. <laughs> and, and this was really interesting for me because I understood how Norwegian I am. So all this like um, stilling. Being a mother of two uh, in Southwest Germany is um, not the same as being a mother <laughs> in Oslo. Most of the mothers, uh, I would say 80%, um, they are only working in the mornings. And my daughter, she started the first grade. She was at school from 9 to 11. Children would just go home because the mothers were home, of course. So these two adults working parents is not a concept. <laughs> we had a babysitter and we had quite a lot of home office. So we practiced some Corona thing and we were working remote, mostly in Norway. So this was okay. But that was strange. And I was reacting at some stuff and all the German bureaucracy. I mean, Norway is uh, great in some ways. Maybe it's part of this, as we were talking about giving space and giving freedom. This is so deeply part of Norwegian culture. And I mean, this is not part of German culture. It's about power and control. And now I'm talking about the German countryside. Uh, this is also different in Eastern Germany, which has a totally different story of equality. Or in the bigger cities like Berlin or Hamburg, it's different. But uh, this power and control thing, it's about um, power is money. And the one uh, having the income is controlling and ha having the power to decide. And this is mostly men. And uh, women 
also having this power of the home, deciding about what is best for the family, for the children, and being the expert of everything. And this is also some kind of power and control, which I see can be difficult to give up. So these are structures that have grown for generations, and it just takes time. So I feel Germany is kind of 15 years behind Norway. Before spending the year in Germany, I always had the feeling that um, I have no home because I'm not I'm not Norwegian and I'm, I'm slowly in growing distance from Germany as well. Living in Germany again, I understood how dear this Norwegian part of me is, how much I belong to Norway. And I understood as well just only the countryside of this home region in Germany is making me feel so much at home. I just can't explain how this is going on inside me just when I'm going there. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to Norwegian Newcomers and remind you that if you want to further support our podcast, we have a Patreon. There you will get every episode one week before everyone else. And we will be able to continue with this project that we really love. You can find us at patreon.com slash Norwegian Newcomers, or you can press the link in the episode description. Thank you very much. It really would mean a lot. It's really hard to have a family and being an artist, survive is not easy in any country. <laughs> but there's a lot more funding and a lot more possibilities in Norway. We're kind of at a turning point now. I have many colleagues in Norway who just look for another job, uh, maybe doing some art on the side. As I know many in their 40s and 50s, they are getting tired of the struggle. So maybe this is what would have happened anyway. I think Norway has quite some opportunities with the fundings and they are really trying to keep artists going. But of course, theatre is live art and it's ritually happening when we are in a room together or spending time together about the story together and creating together in the end. So without public, it's not happening. There is no, there is no, no conversation in the other part. Looking to Germany, I see that... Um, there is, of course, less fundings always. I know uh, people there as well uh, really struggle financially. I see the theatres are really, really creative, um, working with digital formats and virtual reality and really doing great things. I think the Norwegian theatres may be a bit lazy. <laughs> I would have expected maybe more creative stuff okay what am I doing just going to survival mode I've really felt the urge to do some something <laughs> creative so um, I came up with a project to have theater on the phone I was talking to a colleague and friend in Germany in April last year he was just having had a covid infection and I was saying yeah I'm just I'm so sad now I can't give art to people. It's about giving. It's interacting and giving a gift. It's about sharing. How, ca how can we give them time together? I was mentioning that I, would, I just want to, to call people and read them <laughs> some poetry or some text. Um, and he was just listening and uh, then he said, okay, let's do that. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay, let's do that. And then we, we bought a website and, and I found out about the booking system and found some text that we wanted to read. In one week, we had um, a project. Could people call the number? Yeah, they could book a time like you do at the doctor's. You just book an appointment. An actor would call you and ask you, uh, where are you? And uh, if you want to share, how are you today? What's the mood? And um, then based on, on the answer, the actor would choose a text to read, a poem or part of a novel or a monologue. I was doing production and um, concept 
So I was not talking to the people directly, but the actors, they didn't want to stop because they they were sharing these moments and I, I got so many. They would call me afterwards, you know what, now I have to tell you, I, I met this one and he told me and people were sharing really intimate stories about someone dying or really um, existential stuff. Um, and people were touched by text and also some were quite distant in the beginning of the conversation. They would just open up after the experience. So it was, it was a gift for all of us. We did like five, six hundred conversations. We stopped uh, this year in April. So we did it for almost a year. And uh, just got an email from um, a lady and she was uh, talking to the actors every week. She was booking an appointment every week. And this was her interaction in this year. Oh, that's... That's the, yeah, full respect. It sounds, it's a really good idea. It's an art and it's an experience and sharing and it's love. Yeah. <laughs> Even it sounds pathetic, but it's true. But Nelly, I would like you also, because I know that you're super busy. Will you please give us your project for people from Oslo? Possibility where they can check, come. Yes, um, in August, September, I'm working uh, with a play for young children from three to six. So kindergarten <laughs> at the Ungeviken Theater, that's in Lillestrøm, outside of Oslo. And we're doing this play called Liv i Mor. So this is, Liv is the name uh, in in mother. <laughs> and uh, this is close to the Norwegian word Livmor, which is uterus in English. So this is a play for the smallest children about the unborn child in the mother's belly. So um, we play in the belly. <laughs> and uh, that, w- that was my condition that if I, if I do this, we have to have the belly. We meet Liv, little Liv, and she is running inside the belly. And then we follow uh, Liv's uh, development, uh, how she is getting a heart and how she is moving and learning to breathe and all the funny stuff going on on the inside. And then she is born and uh, she goes outside and the children as well. And then they are meeting the mother. So this will will uh, tour in uh, kindergartens. And it premieres the 25th of September. I have had um, two productions that were postponed from... Um, Corona. So there is one uh, playing in Germany, the Wolfsburg, Theater Wolfsburg, called in English, it would be a question of the beginning. So this is about, uh, this is a play for adults about where does our responsibility start? When the planet is going down, is this my fault? Should I do something about it? We are following this couple and they are a bit bored about life. And uh, at the same time, we are following the story of uh, a couple in a foreign country, third world country. In the, in the beginning, the two stories are totally independent from each other, but they start to interfere and every decision is um, having an impact on the other couple. So depending on what they do, the others get the consequences on both sides. How many, can I say, works or plays you wrote until now? I have to count. Um, maybe about 15 plays. That's nice. That's, and would you say that is there anything else or any projects that you that you still didn't uh, start but thinking of? Oh, many. <laughs> <laughs> <Great>. Always many. <laughs> I wasn't ever thinking about writing plays. So this is something that Norway has done for me. When we jump back to the very beginning and all these bar, coffee shop uh, jobs, I needed to let some creativity out. 
And um, I was talking to theatres, but no one would ever hire an actress not speaking properly Norwegian. So I was starting to write more and more. And um, I think the turning point is always for me when this frustration and this energy or destructive energy turns into something creative and gives me the impulse to do something and just I'm, I'm going to do and do and do and do and just produce and just see what's happened, even if I don't know what will happen. Do you see yourself? Are we staying in Norway? I know for myself, I think I will stay. Forever. <laughs> for some time. No, I think um, when I first moved here, I said I can live here for a long, long time, but I have to travel quite a lot to get, get some more impulses or to see something bigger, maybe. I would love to live many places. That would be perfect. I'm not surprised. You are an artist. I think no borders. <laughs> that's the basics. And uh, choose the best from the Norwegian personality and the gym. Uh, Nelly, <laughs> I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And it was really a pleasure. I'm glad that you, you will be part of this uh, little project I'm running. <laughs> me too. Thank you for having me. This episode was made possible with support from Bergis and Steve Telsen and our members on Patreon. If you would like to support our podcast, search for Norwegian Newcomers on Patreon, Facebook or Instagram. We are back next Tuesday. Thank you for listening and take care.